like to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Alexander Senin. He is the Chief Operating Officer at Starny Games, and he will tell us about uh, how missile and artillery strikes affect a team's productivity. So, uh, welcome, Alexander. How are you? Fine, thanks. Hello, everyone. So, yeah. Um, so please share your presentation. Okay, I think I've already shared it, but uh, can yep. you see it? Yeah, okay, yep. great. Yeah, I can see it. So are you okay, ready? Nice. Yeah, so let's go. Well, it's so, uh, not the time for a very long introductions, uh, but let me introduce our team since that's the main topic of my today's speech. Uh, basically, it will be based on what different people on the team did and how we uh, got through this all together uh, through these last two months. Uh, so this is uh, our 16 people crew. Uh, and I'll briefly summarize for you who we are and what we do. So the company was founded by our CEO Igor Timoshenko. And over the last five years, all the rest of the team has joined in. And what we did was we de developed, self-published. So we were in charge of development, marketing, publishing games for PC. You can see those on the right. Five have already been released. And the last one on the bottom right, Strategic Mind, Spirit of Liberty is in production now. And also we've started working for the first time with a publisher on a headquarters World War II title. So on that we work together with Slytherin. Uh, shout out to them. They are really supportive and they also help us to get through these difficult times. So thanks a lot. And we hope that we'll be able to finish the game in timely manner and everyone, all the players who want to play it will be able to play it. Uh, but that's not the topic of our today's speech. So uh, why am I even giving you this speech? Is because um, on the 24th February, Russia invaded Ukraine. And, you know, uh, well, most of us slept through that invasion. So someone, uh, you know, woke up because of loud explosions and stuff. But it depends on where you live and what was happening not far from your uh, apartment or in your case. So uh, in my case, uh, I slept through it and woke up a couple of hours later uh, to the explosions uh, not far from Kiev near the airport. Uh, and I saw that uh, Yuri is calling. I picked up my phone and he said, hey, dude, uh, have you heard that the war has started? And I was like, no, thanks for letting me know. Uh, so he said, yeah, I've just woke up and other colleague called him and told him about the war. So we started like calling each other and I woke up my family and that's how we started like checking out the news and everything. So yeah, and uh, one of my colleagues, Daniel, uh, he's actually usually comes to office really early, like 6 a.m. And so he was going to work when the war started and he was in the office. So he was able to take his PC and his other colleagues PC home when he was there. And so the office was closed shortly after that. Yeah, so basically over the first couple of days, uh, Russian army has invaded from multiple directions, as you can see on this map. And Basically, on the second day of the war, there's already been a few damaged buildings in the Kiev itself. So on this photo, you can see a, a, one of the first apartment buildings that got hit by a, rock, by a missile strike. So it's located not far from one of the Kiev's airfields. So probably it was just widely off target. Mm. And but later there were numerous uh, rocket strikes and even artillery strikes when uh, the Russian army was close to the city, to certain districts, and they weren't haven't been concerned with hitting uh, apartment buildings or like civilians or anything. So um, I'll start with telling uh, the story uh, from the Kate and Alexander's point of view, since. Uh, 
During the first days, uh, there weren't really Russian like uh, regular military troops near the city, but there were some in, like infiltrators sent in advance uh, who tried to get into the city, even a couple of APCs and trucks uh, that tried to break through. And so it wasn't really successful, but it was sort of surprising and unexpected. So these are some uh, enemy vehicles destroyed near the uh, house of uh, Kate and Alexander, where they live. And this is some video shot from their home by their neighbor. Uh, so during the first day, it was really a bit chaotic. And, you know, especially because of those infiltrators and saboteurs and stuff. So everyone were afraid to go anywhere. And the authorities suggested that everyone should stay at home if possible and wait for the like military troops and special operations to deal with those like infiltrators and stuff. Uh, so it wasn't really safe to go outside. And, uh, you know, uh, many people started leaving the city and for many, the problem of pets was really a big one. I know personally, uh, a lot of people who, well, at least one of the reasons why they didn't leave the city was because they had pets and they couldn't like, they didn't have anyone to take care of them. So on these photos, you can see, uh, you know, a cat, a hamster, hedgehog, and snails, all of those pets belong to the Kate and Alexander. And, you know, there are many, like, people with even larger, uh, like, number of pets, and those should be taken, should be, uh, you know, being cared about. So, uh, many people had to leave uh, abandoning their pets uh, without proper care. Uh, many people cooperated, like leaving their pets to family or relatives or friends. Uh, so it was complicated moment, not only for people, but also for pets. You know, war is tough on everyone, even on cats. So uh, the key question for everyone was to leave or not to leave. Uh, and Basically, at that point, like four days into the war, the uh, Russian army was some 15 kilometers from the city. And, uh, you know, just many people were trying to leave and such. Uh, personally, I uh, was pretty sure they wouldn't be able to take the city, so I decided to remain and leave only if absolutely necessary. Uh, but that's like how I think and you know different people have different reasoning and stuff and nobody knew who was right at that point so it was totally made sense to leave and then there is like uh, you know enemy rockets flying and possible artillery strikes if Russian troops come closer so well basically from the distance they could already start shelling Kiev so it wasn't really that safe um so part of the team left for other cities but many people remained in the city and so here are some threats uh, that we were facing not necessarily right in kiev but just for the understanding and so that you understand what i'm talking about later in the speech so first group is russian army and police forces so i won't go into details those are different like uh, army or military or police uh, troops that they were sending. Uh, they were sending riot police together with the army to maybe battle some protests in occupied cities or something. Then there is Russian infiltrators. Uh, those are sort of mysterious guys with military training and sometimes even with APCs who've materialized from nowhere basically either they were here before or they are some advanced uh, troops uh, of the enemy which moved in small groups and sneaked past our defenses somehow so uh, those are like military types of enemies who are fought by like ukrainian armed forces and national guard national guard is something between like army and police they usually guard some important infrastructure and stuff but they also fight in the war um, 
so there were then hired subadures, uh, both locals and foreigners. Uh, so those usually uh, weren't like some trained guys. There were usually, I don't know, some random people hired on the internet to draw some special signs for like 15 bucks or some nonsense like that. So it would sometimes even be like school children or like some girls or I don't know, whoever, like uh, it's usually some poor people or with some addictions who want to get some money to buy some booze or something. So all sorts of people like, and those, those were also, so they had different tasks from correcting artillery to drawing some signs for the Russian troops to maybe placing some simple explosives or something like that. So uh, those were caught in large numbers and basically Russians were trying to hire some locals for that especially. And then there are looters and thieves. So, you know, during the war, it's, uh, you know, every war saw those. And basically since police and army are very busy with dealing with the enemy invasion, uh, some entrepreneurial people try to take advantage of that and especially when many people leave the city and leave their house or apartment unattended it's you know very tempting for some uh, guys to get in and drop them so uh, basically people had to fend for themselves so my neighbor caught one of those guys uh, trying to steal a bicycle from near the apartment and, and basically uh, talked to him and let him go and then the next day we saw the photo of him on the internet tied to a tree by some other people maybe he tried to rob them afterwards and was caught again so unlucky guy uh, but basically uh, people dealt with those and or then gave them to police when it arrived but police reaction time was very slow because they were overloaded with uh, tasks at that point so then we have territorial defense uh, those are really um, important element of ukraine's defense those are volunteers based army and they protect their like local territory but then if it's safe then can be moved to other regions of ukraine then there is the regular like local police forces like police special forces were helping out the army and then there are unarmed volunteers which is regular people who just want to help in any way they can they can bring supplies help with logistics uh, help uh, tend to wounded whatever is necessary they will help and that's actually one of the very strong sides of ukraine it, that's something that helped us uh, pull through in 2014 and 2015 so uh, let's, there is really a lot lots of people who want to help in all possible way or in any necessary do, do what's necessary uh, to help everyone and win so uh alexander tuzinski tried to join the territorial defense uh but he got turned down due to the lack of combat of military training and that's actually one of the reasons for example i didn't apply because Many people told me that there is no, uh, that there is a huge, like, uh, cr like huge queue uh, on trying to get into the territorial defense. Uh, so abundance of volunteers and they take only people with uh, military training or combat experience. So, uh, yeah, and they said that if we need, we will call upon you, but uh, so far uh, they didn't. So I think there are more than enough uh, people who volunteered with better training. But Alexander knew many of those who got accepted into the territorial defense. So on, during the first week, he went on patrols with them. And basically they were looking for signs like this uh, that were placed to correct uh, fire. I, I don't know how exactly that works, but everyone were worried about the signs. Maybe it was exaggerated, but still. Uh, and they've also caught a couple of uh, thieves who were trying to break into apartment. And so they caught those guys and waited for the police and handed them over to the police. Uh, but then in a week, uh, 
basically the command was improved and they were told that only the actual territorial defense can go on patrols and no civilians were allowed and they suggested that alexander better become a volunteer and help something so he helped like bring some water supplies to a damaged hospital building or something like that uh but yeah he couldn't go on patrols anymore uh then uh, there are people from uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. So those people, I think, uh, were hit harder than anyone because they've already been through that uh, in 2014 and later. So, for example, so we have one guy on the team who lived in Donetsk for several years under occupation and then moved here and started working for us. And then there are like people with family and friends and relatives uh, either near the front line or in occupied territories. And, you know, it's tough. And especially for people who moved from there, either 2014 or later, uh, they started basically their usual life was destroyed by war back then they moved to kiev or to other cities in ukraine and started building a new life and thought that they can forget about war and that's in the past and now it comes knocking to their door again so that was like really harsh for them and that's like an old wound opening up all over again and i think those pictures they summarize like <laughs> most of what went through their heads when the war started. So um, I believe I, I've talked to different people uh, from Donetsk and Lugansk area and for them it's, it's probably uh, the worst, but at the same time they were the most prepared because they've already been through that. Like in my house uh, there was a neighbor who spent months in the basement during bombardments uh in 2014 and his house was completely destroyed so they got out of shelter and saw that there was no house and so they moved to kiev and started living here and now the war has come here so he was the most prepared he said like we should get all the supplies and etc in the basement and we'll survive everything there no matter what happens we'll get through this etc so he was really very well prepared for that but also very worried that this is the story will uh, repeat itself and uh, a separate aspect is that uh, many people have relatives friends uh, families uh, as i've said near the front lines on unoccupied territories who don't want to leave or who cannot leave due to different reasons and it's uh, harsh I, I mean for an outsider it might be easy like why don't you just move your family here and you know uh, we'll get by somehow and it's not so problematic like come on man do that but in reality some people are really stubborn and there could be multiple reasons why they don't want to move so uh, and you are constantly worried about how they are getting by there because it's very risky area to be in right now so you know it, it, it's really tough uh, on the guys who, who had uh, their family there so and one of our uh, employees like spent months convincing his family to move and fortunately recently uh, his mom and dad and um, some other relatives moved in uh, to him but his grandfather and grandmother remained near the front line so we are very worried about them um, and that's just one example so there are really lots of stories like this all over ukraine uh yeah so uh, uh daniel uh Lapshin is like one of the guys who basically he is the guy who spent several years in uh, Don living in donetsk and now he has built his new life in kiev and basically his house is like the outermost house in the city and the enemy forces were fighting in Rupin town near the near kiev so it's like seven kilometers from his house and there is like forest 
between this town and his house, and that's also the forest starts at his house, basically. Yeah. So he was really worried, and there was like Ukrainian artillery fighting Russian artillery, and they were firing at each other throughout the day and night. So uh, you couldn't really concentrate on work when there is like artillery firing all day long. Um, so we've decided that I'll come to him and take him to my place while the situation is not resolved. So uh, how I get there, I called the taxi and basically Uber stopped working uh, in Ukraine after the war started, but there is a local service called Duklon, uh, which is basically the same. So I used that to call a taxi. And when the driver arrived, I, I was really happy that there are still some drivers who, who work and who, I, I guess many of them were sort of volunteers to help people uh, get around the city because public transport wasn't working and everything. So I've asked him straight away, like, are you ready to go to the district? And he said, well, <laughs> I I'm, cannot say I'm very eager to do that, but well, let's go. And as we went, uh, he was maybe around 60 years old and uh, we've talked throughout the ride and turned out he uh, fought in Afghanistan in his youth and, you know, he was a very intelligent and nice person. So uh, when we went through the city, it was all blocked with multiple checkpoints and multiple barricades, so it was really difficult to navigate. And we went through numerous checks uh, to get from point A to point B. Basically, where I live is blue dot on the map, and where Daniel lives is orange dot, and the red area is uh, what was uh, controlled by Russia on that day. Uh, so there was an evacuation effort going on along the highway into the Kiev. And when basically we've picked up uh, Daniel and went back and now on our way back. Uh, so when we come to his place, there was really loud uh, artillery going on uh, throughout it, but it wasn't shelling that exact area. So uh, that was okay. And basically when we started moving back uh, to my place, uh, we, we had to enter the city because his house is literally like almost outside of it. Uh, the territorial defense guy came up to our car and asked if we can uh, take uh, two more passengers to the central railway station in the central Kiev, and we said sure. And they've uh, so the the couple from uh, Bucha showed up, and uh, we took them to the central railway station on our way back. And what they told us was that uh, basically uh, they were living in. Uh, uh, town of Bucha and um, uh, they were hiding in the basement and territorial defense came uh, and uh, asked them to get out because Russians will be here any moment and their house was hit so they were afraid that it will fall apart and block them in the basement so they quickly got out, they couldn't pack anything, they basically had nothing on them except for cell phone maybe, uh, no backpacks, no nothing. And basically they took them to the highway and then uh, the buses brought them to the entrance to the city and then they got on board our taxi. And basically they've told us that their parents are living in Mariupol. And so they are very worried for the parents. And this couple uh, moved from Mariupol just some three months ago to live in a safer and quieter place. And now their new home was totally demolished. And they said that they really don't know where to go or what to do. So I was hoping that they maybe could reach out to some relatives in some other cities and move somewhere. But they were really angry and but they really didn't know what they're gonna do because they really had nowhere to go. 
And so the new lived at my place for all the months. And now that the situation became much better and Russian forces are no longer in Kiev, he went back and checked his apartment. So in half of the house, uh, the windows were broken by a nearby explosion and there were a number of explosions in his district. But fortunately, his apartment was intact and his car also was intact. So he was quite happy with the outcome. So uh, another uh, story is how very mundane or easy things could become very difficult in the war time. So uh, since uh, the war uh, started, like uh, we had to switch to remote work and not all people on the team had uh, powerful PCs at home. So when since became a bit more clear, maybe after a week or so. Um, we've decided that it's a good idea to go and get everyone's PCs uh, from the office to their homes so they can work uh, with, uh, you know, in good conditions. And basically, <laughs> it turned out to be uh, easier said than done. So Alexander Tuzinski was really brave to go first on like re literally second or third day of the invasion when there was like enemy infiltrators in several districts of the city. But he said like, who cares, it's another district. Uh, he took his car and went to our office. Uh, but, so he got there successfully. And when he entered, he realized he didn't get the key. So he went back to his home to get the key. And when he got the key, he tried to go back to office, but he was stopped by at some checkpoint and they told him, no, 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 you are not going anywhere. We are like fighting infiltrators everywhere in the city. So it's very risky. You should go later, like don't go there today. So he went back. And so we wait uh, for a few days for the situation to become more secure. And, you know, we've never rushed anyone. So I've told the guys, like, it's totally up to you when you do that. It's uh, no pressure, like, decide when it's safe and when we all think it's safe to go. And we've also had to uh, coordinate that with the owners of the building because they would have to send, it was closed for security reasons. And the security, we would need to call a security guy who lived nearby so he could come and open the building for us. Uh, and basically, uh, another problem was that uh, Kiev is located on two banks of the large river Dnieper, and there are several bridges across that, and they were sort of off limits to general public for the first days. So uh, Alexander and Dominique live on the left bank and uh, our office and like rest of the guys live on the right bank. So Alexander and Dominique couldn't get across and they did multiple tries to pass those checkpoints, but there were traffic jams and they were sort of told that only like military and special transport can cross and you cannot maybe later. Um, and so uh, what Alexander, so and then they told Alexander that he can cross on foot. So he had to go uh, to the bridge, then cross, it is a lengthy bridge, I would say, uh, cross it on foot, then go to subway uh, and trains were going only one per hour, then go to office, take his PC, take subway back. Uh, then I and Daniel met him and took PC of Igor to send to him to send it to Igor and then Alexander crossed uh, the bridge on foot back to the left river bank. And so basically it was sort of special operation to get your PC from an office, which sounds like some very easy thing to do, but not so easy uh, when there is a wartime situation in the city. Uh, and now we come to the, uh, I would say, the most the key uh, story from my today's uh, talk. So that's the story of Alexander Andrushuk, who lived under Russian occupation in Bucha. So I've called this uh, my garage is my castle because uh, when the war started, his whole family uh, moved f from there. So they have a house in Bucha, but they also have a garage some few hundred meters from there. And so 
uh, they uh, took all the supplies and everything and moved it into the garage. Uh, and that turned out to be the right move probably later on. Uh, so uh, they hid in the basement and for the first few days, it seems all right. Uh, they had electricity, they had water supply, they even had internet. So everything was more or less okay. They had the heater there, so they were more or less comfortable as comfortable as you can be living in the basement, I think. Uh, then um, uh, the situation deteriorated. So at first they thought that they were safe in Bucha because it's sort of outskirts of Kiev. So they thought that the enemy would go for Kiev itself. It would bypass Bucha basically. But if you study the map and if you understand how the military forces would probably operate, you could have guessed that they would go there. So it was a risky assumption uh, to stay there, but you know, everyone were uh, very like uh, uh, confused uh, with everything that was going on. So it's uh, easy to, to make such assumption in that situation. So first there was a battle of Hostomel airfield right next to Bucha. So it's a neighboring town and basically uh, on the first day, Russians dropped their uh, paratroopers uh, from uh, helicopters and uh, seized the airfield, but the Ukrainian army immediately retaliated. And so there was a heavy fighting for throughout the night and the following day. And so these uh, paratroopers were scattered. But then they later regular Russian forces arrived that crossed the border in Belarus. So uh, there was again fighting for Hostomel airfield. And so by the time they decided that, uh, it, you know, the situation deteriorates rapidly and maybe they should leave, the bridge that was leading to Kiev across the nearby river was just demolished. And basically, they didn't know where the Russian forces or enemy infiltrators or some advanced scout groups were. And so it was risky to go on the open road with the car. You know, anyone could shot you for any reason. So it was sort of risky to move versus risky to stay situation. And since they didn't have full information, they assumed that it was safer to hide in the basement and hope that the Ukrainian army wins. Well, it won, but I would say much later and after the Buche was occupied. So um, not ideal scenario for Alexander and his family. And uh, basically when the heavy fighting started in Buche itself, uh, they lost uh, water, heating and electricity supply, but they had some stored uh, in advance. Uh, so uh, road to Kiev was blocked, it, as it said. And they've read reports of civilians being taken hostage, so they were very worried. And uh, basically, uh, they were lucky that one of their neighbors turned such garage into his uh, regular house. So he had like power generator and everything and large supplies. So he was sharing with everybody. And so uh, Russian forces entered Bucha. And here is some of the accounts uh, by Alexander that he personally saw. So first of all, he saw the enemy tank being destroyed when they were storming the town. Uh, then they saw lots of enemy tanks moving by. Uh, there were some group of five volunteers who were trying to do something. Alexander doesn't know exactly what. And one of them got shot by the Russian troops and got two bullet wounds. And so they took him to this garage a group of garages and they were in the hiding and so the people there tried to give them first aid but they were unable to do so well because there was no trained medic nearby and but luckily the guy uh, survived because there was another person uh, who was helping out everyone in the neighborhood uh, driving his car and he was really fearless because he would drive past Russians like uh, no big deal and so he took those wounded guy into his car and tried to sneak out, uh, but he met face to face with the Russian tank. And so he quickly retreated and said, oh, well, sorry, not this time, guys. 
And then the next day he checked that there are no Russian troops around and he sneaked out and somehow got that guy to safety. So there are fearless and lucky people out there. Uh, and then um, there was also another guy who was correcting uh, Ukrainian artillery fire and he got shot uh, by the Russian troops. And so the people around tried to call for an ambulance, but of course it couldn't go there, couldn't pass the front line. So unfortunately that guy uh, died two days later at their hands. And so basically all the people who were hiding in those garages uh, sort of united and started helping out each other and looking for some extra supplies and sharing supplies that they had. So, uh, you know, they were really united at helping out each other and everything. But uh, so they've lived through a week of uh, occupation. Uh, maybe a bit more. So on the 9th of uh, uh, March, uh, the official evacuation effort was announced. And so uh, they were worried whether to leave or not, because parents started saying that it's risky to go and it could be a trap and everything. Um, so um, parents went to check out their house and saw Mm, Russian troops inside, so they didn't go in because there were Russians inside. Um, and uh, basically, when they returned uh, months later, uh, they saw that uh, they've tried to loot the house, but it was not too bad. Uh, one of the funny things is that they wrote We Club at the door of Alexander's room, so maybe there were some sort of disco parties there, we don't know. Um, so yeah, when uh, they went to house, they saw a lot of dead bodies outside, something that you now know as Bucha massacre. So it was already there, well, at least large part of it, uh, uh, because some people were killed uh, on 5th, 6th March. So on 9th March, they were already like dead bodies that were laying there for a few days. And so when they saw all of that, they decided that they should indeed leave because it's too dangerous to remain there. And so uh, they boarded their car and go uh, went to the meeting point. And so on this map, uh, Alexander told me they are like uh, it's evacuation route. Uh, so you can see from Bucha in the north, to the Ukrainian controlled town of Bilogorodka in the south. And so uh, when they went to the meeting point, there was a large column of cars, like five or seven kilometers long, and they were waiting for the evacuation buses that were supposed to take people who didn't have their own transport and they would lead the column. But the buses got suspended on their way by the Russian troops, so they didn't arrive and the column moved without the buses. And so uh, this path uh, that I've drawn on the map, it's actually not such a large distance. Uh, you can go it maybe in 30 minutes on a good day, but uh, at that time and because of checkpoints and large column, it took them 12 hours to make all this pass. So the whole day. And halfway through, they realized that first, they don't follow the official evacuation route. And second, uh, the guys at the head of the column just started moving. They didn't wait for the official like uh, groups that should have been at the head of the evacuation column. So, because those guys couldn't uh, reach them. So part of the people got scared and turned back, uh, but the majority kept going. And uh, basically they were lucky because such a large column, I think Russians didn't expect it to be, you know, sort of an authorized evacuation effort. So they, they thought it was, everything was uh, moving as agreed and they didn't make very thorough checks because on the following days, the checks were much more thorough and some equipment got stolen and some people were mistreated and everything but on the day on the first day when alexander was moving out it was uh, uh, more calm and but uh, basically 
uh, at some point uh, one of some of the cars at the back of the column uh, got delayed for some reason and they've tried to catch up to the column and they've met with Russian tank who actually fired at them. Well, that's the story that Alexander told me. And uh, is the shell exploded like right next to the car. So the car uh, sort of flipped 360 degrees, uh, then went back on its wheels and kept moving and moved out of the fire successfully. So that's not some American blockbuster. It's now Ukrainian uh, reality. Uh, and uh, fortunately, they've uh, reached Belogorodka at the end of the day, stayed there for the night at the refugee camp, and then uh, moved to some other cities. They didn't go to Kiev. Uh, they thought it was probably risky. They didn't know what was going to happen next. So they moved to their uh, family in some safer small town in, uh, uh, like, more to the west uh, of Ukraine. Um, so that's uh, the story of Alexander and his uh, successful evacuation from Bucha. And, you know, I know some other people who got under occupation but get out successfully. But we all know lots of horrible stories of how the people were killed, raped, and, 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 so, and so on. So, and you know, and when they were getting out, Alexander saw his, with his own eyes all those dead bodies left and right. So it's, it's truly horrible. And we are really happy and thankful that at least he and his family were able to get out. But, you know, many people uh, couldn't. So basically, when all of our team were relatively safe, some of us in Kiev, some in other cities in, in Ukraine, uh, we tried to restore our operations. So that was about 10 days into the war, obviously later for some people who didn't have PC with them when they left, or like Alexander, who was occupied in Bucha and had to get out and stuff. And, you know, when you are just out, you also can't work for a couple of weeks because, you know, it's uh, very uh, traumatizing events and everything. And so uh, basically people were free to work as, as they could. So if they can and if they want to be a bit distracted from all the chaos going around them, uh, they are more than welcome. But if they can't, uh, no, no one will, will say anything to them. And basically we've tried to help as, as much as, as we could, although that that was very limited under the situation. But the first thing that I did uh, that's my job basically is to make sure that everyone got their salary on time uh, day on day and there are no delays and no issues because first of all uh, you know people like need, need money in this situation and second they could donate some of it to support ukraine so uh that's really important that the company keeps operating and keeps paying salaries to people is the foundation of that mm. And so, but we have a very hardworking and dedicated team. And so, uh, you know, everyone were eager to work as much as they could. Obviously, it's not as productive as usually, but I know that many people are doing their best. And uh, basically, um, for the guys who moved out of Kiev, uh, the key issues was that they didn't have a uh, good PC with them uh, or they have bad internet connection. Because in Kiev, uh, I've never had a problem with internet throughout these last two months. Uh, but some guys who moved to other regions uh, faced some difficulties with that as well. But not nothing major and so uh you know but it's also important to just call people and talk with them and not about work just about the situation and about their life and family and everything and it's uh, really important to show support and understanding to each other and i think we've talked at a lot uh, about like personal matters uh, throughout these two weeks the uh, two months and I would say that, uh, you know, in difficult times, people become more united. And despite moving further apart, we certainly became even more united than before. Uh, so uh, here you can see the peak of a Russian advance near Kiev, but that's where they were stopped. And then they had to retreat to avoid total encirclement and defeat. Uh, 
Uh, so now Kiev is more or less safe. We have a few air alerts per day. Uh, one was just uh, some two hours ago before my talk started, but you know, uh, they rarely hit anything in Kiev lately. I mean, last week they hit a couple of uh, military production plants, uh, but that's it. So we still have to react to uh, air alerts, but it I could say that it's more or less safe in Kyiv, as safe as it could be under daily uh, missile strikes, I would say. And I want to tell also about how the whole world supports Ukraine and refugees from Ukraine. So we are really thankful. So uh, Katerina Globa uh, spent several days or rather maybe the first week in three different bomb shelters in Kiev because there is no bomb shelter in her house. So she searched the district for different places to hide. And all of them were sort of, you know, not the most comfy places. Uh, so she moved to another town and then left for Poland and then learned that there is a refugee support program from Ireland. So she went to Ireland and is really thankful for the hospital reception there. So she stays there for now and she's safe. And also our uh, CEO Igor. So uh, when we talked before the war, and we were sort of discussing what would happen if the Russians attack and what would you do, etc. And so what he said to me is like, I'm not worried too much about myself. Like I can keep working in Kiev. It's no big deal, but I cannot like, you know, sit and write some code and thinking every second that uh, at any moment, uh, enemy missile or shell can hit the kindergarten where my five-year-old daughter uh, is and that she would be dead. So, like, if anything happens, I will move my family out and, and keep working. So, basically, he did exactly that. When the war started, he took his family and helped them uh, get out of country and then went back to Kiev. So... Uh, now his wife, five-year-old daughter and two-year-old son are safe in the United Kingdom. So once again, thank you. Uh, and Igor himself remains in Kiev. Uh, you know, it's hard to be uh, separated from the family, but at the same time, at least you know that they are safe and nothing threatens their life. And you can always reunite when it's uh, safer in Ukraine. And so uh, I would like to say that, you know, uh, we supported the Ukrainian war effort and humanitarian initiatives in various ways. Like, it's not like I want a badge or something. I'm just telling you how it was. So, uh, you know, first of all, uh, Igor donated some as a part on behalf of starting games and then uh, I, I know like I myself donated something and I know many guys donated and maybe may probably did but didn't tell me about that so uh, I'm sure I don't know even half of what uh, we did uh, but I know enough to know that the trial guys did their best and you know it's often minor things like helping to bring water to a damaged hospital building or donating some clothing to the refugees or helping to build barricades, but every little bit counts. So uh, I invite you to join us and help Ukraine. Uh, so I call for the support of Ukraine and there are like dozens of ways to do it. I will offer you three, but you can find other ways that suit you better. So the first one is the games gathering event organizers. Uh, you can read the detailed description uh, at the event, and basically it's targeted to our colleagues from Ukrainian game dev industry. Uh, uh, then there is a National Bank of Ukraine special account to support Ukrainian armed forces uh, if you want to help our army. Uh, and police. Uh, that's where I donated, uh, well, at least one of the places where I donated. And the biggest uh, volunteers initiative that I know uh, is the both military and humanitarian help is uh, Come Back Alive. Uh, 
but there are some other ways to help uh, Ukrainian war and humanitarian efforts. Uh, but I encourage you to make sort of checks uh, before sending money and to make sure that uh, the guys do what they uh, promise and that they've already done something uh, to make sure that your money really make a difference and you know are not uh, wasted on some um, not very honest initiatives or something okay so i think that will be the end of my talk and i would be more than happy to answer any questions that we have i do hope there are a lot of questions but uh, in any case uh, thanks everyone for attention and now it's uh, time to answer your questions uh thank you alexander thank you um I really, yeah, I just have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really uh, admire your story. It's uh, really encouraging. And I, I remember my times uh, building fortifications and creating these flammable cocktails. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. something to remember. <laughs> yeah, that was something to remember. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I'm realized that uh, I am uh, grandpa who saw the war and <laughs> <laughs> that's true. so oh yeah okay so that's it mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry <Yeah. laughs> uh, uh, we have uh, I encourage you to visit uh, mm -hmm. our chat and find because we have uh, James and he I would like to interview you about your Kiev experiences after the conference. So I believe uh, this is mm -hmm. uh, this will be interesting, and we have a lot of uh, thanks and support words in chat. So um, thank you, Alexander. I hope you are safe. I hope your family is safe, uh, and thank you for everything you've done and you are doing for our country to uh, make our victory come come to us as fast as possible thank you for inviting and thank you for holding this great event hopefully see we'll see Bye. see everyone in the next games gathering events <laughs> yeah i hope and we'll I get really through this so. war and everything will have a happy end yeah we'll win thank you Slava Ukraine. Heroim Slava.